All right, so let's get started. Um, today, we'll be talking about building test-driven JavaScript components. And in this presentation, um, there's three things I want to focus on. Um, in what ways you guys can develop small single person, or so small single person, small single purpose components that does one thing well. Um, another way of building components that are robust and can be reused across different projects. And then how do you take a series of these components and then integrate it into your current projects? So uh, some logistics is that it's gonna be an interactive presentation, so feel free to uh, yell a question out at any time. And uh, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. You can shoot me an email. So even after the presentation, we can look at your current code base and see how you guys can start using or improve on your JavaScript uh, unit tests. So what inspired me for this presentation was Apple's go-to fail bug. So what happened in September of 2012, Apple released code in OS X, Mavericks, and iOS 7, which basically it exited the SSL secure handshake prematurely. So this code block right here, what happened is there's an extra go-to fail right there. So your final handshake step never even happened. So there were some good blog posts that kind of broke this down, and some people were saying, well, if they used curly braces, this never would have happened. It would have been more readable. Or if there were code reviews, somebody would have saw that. None of that really guaranteed any of that. So um, a big piece was unit tests. Even though this is not JavaScript, if you had a unit test or integration tests that basically tested your algorithm that said, hey, this is the way my algorithm should and should not work, this would have so stood out like a sore thumb. So that is kind of what encouraged me about a year ago to start building tests into my current projects. So the past couple years, JavaScript has really proven itself uh, as a programming language that can build complex applications. So the past three years, I've been head down in JavaScript development. And basically, JavaScript is not an object-oriented programming language, but you can follow object-oriented like patterns. Um, some of those patterns are um, basically creating objects that have data and behavior. These are our components. Um, so there was a lot more code that was on the server side, but now we're trying to strike the correct balance between code that runs on your server and code that runs on the client. As you have more code running in JavaScript, complexity rises, and as complexity rises, that's when you'll benefit most from testing. So, JavaScript testing is pretty much easy. Um, you can get started very quickly writing JavaScript tests. So let's say our boy Clippy over here is our component on the page. Clippy has some data about him. Maybe that message sometimes will just pop up for no particular reason. And he has behavior, those animations of him coming in and out of the viewport. Um, so let's say we wanted to write some naive tests for this. Uh, this test right here, we're saying um, we have a get name method. He's returning his name Clippy. And then I invoke that method. I exercise that code. And then I have an assert, and I get logged to the console. This is a very naive way of testing, but this is how easy it is. You got at least doing something. Uh, when we say this output right here, we're basically asserting that we believe this to be true. Um, so you, you can ask this yourself. When you go to use someone else's JavaScript library or component or framework, do they have tests? Would you want to bring somebody else's code into your code base and they don't have tests? You pretty much assume that their code just works, and we all know that it sometimes just doesn't. So would you want to deliver code to your client or within your project that does not have tests? No. So what we can do is we can develop responsibly and start writing tests for our client-side code. Uh, with, with tests, what you can do is you can develop code and refactor it and deploy it with tons of confidence. Um, what you can see right here, this is Moment.js. On Moment.js's production site, they basically say Moment.js is a utility or tool for manipulating, uh, parsing, and displaying dates. What they have is 45,000 tests passed on production. So when you go to this website right here, it runs all their unit tests in the browser. So if I'm like, hey, I have some date object and I need to display it in a weird manner, all right, Moment.js will do this for me. What I'm saying, can I trust this library? I mean, that, that gives you tons of confidence to bring this code into your code base and integrate it with your current tools. 
Um, one of the big things that I took away is that JavaScript testing is actually hard. Uh, what I found was hard about it is that I was writing JavaScript code in a way that was difficult to test. Um, there's tons of open source frameworks that make JavaScript testing easy, but if your code is not written in a testable way, you're going to struggle. Uh, I'll, I'll be touching on some code e examples here. But um, honestly, the, the, the most difficult thing for me to get started uh, testing my JavaScript was changing the way I was writing my JavaScript. So, uh, some really quick examples right here. Um, if you just say var name in some script, um, by default it goes into the global namespace. You do not want to put variables into the global namespace. It's not a good or a best practice because what if everyone else was using globals? You're going to get naming conflicts. These, sub, these subtle bugs will come up. In closures, uh, JavaScript is a uh, functional scope programming language, and outside of this function, you cannot access the name variable. Um, anonymous functions. So in this function right here, this function does not have a name. So this function right here, how would you test that? There's, there's no name for it. Um, this right here is more of an integration test because you're depending on the DOM being there. You are depending on this ID to be there. So if you wanted to test just this click handler, good luck. It doesn't even have a name. How are you going to call that from outside of this script? Um, callback hell. So who has experienced code like this? Who's experienced callback hell? Yeah, so in this example right here, how would you test this asynchronous function three as a unit test? Just test it by itself. You, you can't because function one and two has to complete, and what happens in three, who, who knows? You can't do that. So basically what you're doing right here is you're making it more complicated. You're overdoing it. So, there's a way you can develop code to avoid callback hell. Um, the asynchronous code that we just saw was pretty simple to read, but as you add more code in those callbacks, it becomes very difficult to read. As you have difficult to read and difficult to maintain code, you likely have bugs lurking in there. That is an awesome place to start testing. Complex code bases or difficult to read areas. Um, we saw in the go-to fail bug, that code wasn't even difficult to read, yet millions of people were impacted by it. We don't even know the devastating impacts of how many man-in-the-middle attacks took place due to the go-to fail bug, and that code wasn't even difficult. Um, so this is from the Angular docs, and basically what Angular is kind of pushing for is writing code that is very testable. And from the very beginning of getting started with Angular, they basically say, hey, start writing code, and when you do that, here is some protractor tests that prove that to you that it works. They are encouraging to write very testable code. Um, there's there's a, some high-level things that Angular wants you to do. Uh, they want you to separate your DOM manipulation from your application's logic. So a good example of this that I found myself doing wrong is I had a switch case statement that was returning some category. And in that switch case, I just wasn't returning the category. I was also modifying CSS classes. So I was doing application logic, but also relying on the DOM to be there. As soon as I went to unit test that, I wasn't doing one thing. I was returning the category, but I was also changing the styles along with it. Angular strongly and other front-end frameworks strongly discourage writing code that does two things in your application logic and your display. Um, the other thing that's important here is separating your client-side code from server-side code. This way you can develop things in parallel where if the server changes, your client-side code is not impacted. Um, so unit testing, I'm jumping in this testing piece first, mainly because it's the easiest, and it's the easiest for you to start doing today. Um, so let's say tomorrow or Monday, or if you're working this weekend, you start developing a new component. When you start developing this new component, think about adding tests for this. Unit testing is something that you can do as a developer and on your development team without having any stakeholders or business areas even know that you're doing it, but you're starting to deliver more testable and higher quality code. Uh, some unit test fundamentals. So this is a very common um, alliteration right here, range, act, and assert. But a range is basically what you're expecting your code should be doing. So maybe this is the output of your algorithm. Then you actually exercise that code 
and then you assert. You're basically confirming what I'm expecting my code is doing is actually doing. Red green refactor. So this is the concept of whenever you add some new functionality, you write a unit tests that fail. That's red. And then you actually implement the code. It should turn green, and then you move on. Um, it's not a triangle, though. You don't write a unit test that fails, and then when that passes, and then refactor your code just because it's the next step. The refactoring is some at unarbitrary, necessary point in the future where you need to change the way you're doing things. So as you change your code, you can run your tests to make sure that you haven't broke anything that was previously working. Um, the way I look at refactoring, it was kind of like a, a paper you would write in school. You would not write your paper and turn your first draft in and say, I'm done. Refactoring is basically getting your code working and then revising it to make it better. Uh, unit test fundamentals, these are just some things where uh, it kind of gets blurry. Hey, am I doing a unit test or am I doing an integration test or an end-to-end -end test? The unit tests need to run as fastly as possible. So, Whenever you write new code, you don't want to wait for your unit tests. Um, I'll show a video here shortly of how your unit tests can run in the background and you just observe what is happening. Um, uh, controlling the environment. So let's think about an XML HTTP request of something going out to the server. You can't always control that server. You may own the server, but you're basically doing an integration test because you're depending on some other environment in which you cannot control. Uh, the self-documenting piece, this is not documentation for your end users of your app. This is documentation for developers. Um, this is documentation how things should work. And um, the hard-to-reach areas of, of code, uh, that's very helpful to write unit tests for. This is like your unhappy path. So let's say you're hitting a web server and you get a good response 99% of the time. Are you going to exercise that 99 or that you're going to ex execute that code 99 times just for that one failure to see if your exception is thrown properly? No. So it's nice to write a unit test that is testing the unhappy path. It's a very hard area of your code to exercise. Uh, one thing that I've done with uh, this hard to reach areas is form validation. Are you going to tr try the 30 different ways an input field could be invalid over and over and over again, or are you going to write a unit test that explicitly calls out those 30 cases that should be false? Um, I'm not endorsing Require.js or Jasmine. These are just some tools that I've used in the past that helped me build component-based JavaScript modules and run tests against those. So uh, has, has anyone, people, is anyone familiar with Require.js and Jasmine? Is there? OK, cool. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, because there's, there's uh, already pretty a strong understanding of it. But with require, what require is helpful for is um, it's, it's, very config, it's very configurable. So paths are basically aliases to your components. So jQuery is a very popular one. Wherever we require jQuery for one of our components, we can just say jQuery. If we ever need to upgrade from jQuery 1.7 to 1.11 or even 2. Point whatever it is now, you just have to change it in one spot. And then you know all of your components that require jQuery, you can then easily test them, hey, how do they work in, or in jQuery 2.0? It's very configurable, and it allows us to try new things without changing a lot of different areas of our code base. This is extremely important because breaking changes are a natural thing within software. Browsers are continuously self-updating themselves, and who knows in a year from now if some JavaScript function you're using is no longer being used. You can find out very quickly by having unit tests to see what breaks. Um, with this as a module right here, so when we basically say define, we're depending on jQuery, and we're returning an object that has uh, two behaviors. Pretty simple concept right here. We could consider this our component. If we were doing tests for this, we would test this function and that function. Um, this, this, this fella here, uh, Jasmine, Jasmine provides us a lot of helper functions to exercise our code. So there are Jasmine keywords such as uh, describe. This is our suite. Uh, this is often used as your module. So in our suite of tests, I'm basically doing a unit test uh, 
like structure here to say our module should get the current month. What I can do is then invoke that helper function and then assert. Uh, this is, again, a very simple example, but what you do is you just rinse and repeat. So what I often do is for each one of my methods, uh, I have a it, which is my spec, to test the happy and the unhappy path. So if I'm creating a reusable com component, uh, I may pass an array in, but in the future, when I'm reusing this for a month from now, I might pass an object in. How, does, how can I test those different scenarios? I can write a unit test for it and exercise all these different areas of code. So when you bring these two together, uh, Jasmine also provides a before each. So each before each one of these specs run, before each it, what it does is it says, using required JS, go get my date module and instantiate a new one. This way, as I manipulate my, the instance of the my date object, I always start fresh. Each one of my unit tests is always starting with a fresh instance of my component. Then after each, I just set it undefined, clear it out. And you go on and on and on. Uh, the, the important piece here is that we're using required J, or sorry, we're using required JS and Jasmine together to help us build JavaScript components in a reasonable manner and test driven. So at a high level, this is what your structure would look like. So describe is this module, these are the specs, describe, here's my module, and so on. So you can break these out into different files or have it in one big file, and you can have all these run together. So what this is right here is to do M MVC. So there's a lot of different JavaScript frame frameworks. What to do MVC is it's showing you all the different ways you can write this to do app using Ember, using Angular, using vanilla JS. And what they do is, is they have tests that must pass in order to successfully build this to do app. And what they're doing is they're using Jasmine that runs all the tests and they're leveraging model view controller as components. So we have our model, that's a component. We have our view, that's our component. These are the behaviors and what it should do. What they have is 56 specs. These are our unit tests that run to validate that the app is doing what it should do. So uh, this is another quote from AngularJS. Uh, this is basically what I've already talked about where they've, they're pushing you towards writing code that is testable. Um, so this was the biggest way uh, that writing, my, uh, writing unit tests for my JavaScript changed the way I wrote my code. So when I'm saying it changed the way I wrote JavaScript, I'm saying to do refactor to make it unit test friendly. I'm gonna be devil's advocate and say this is bad code, this is bad JavaScript. I wrote tons of JavaScript like, like this, but can anyone tell me why we're considering this bad? Okay, DOM, DOM manipulation. Um, what we're doing right here is how can, we basically have our view, our data access, our, mod, our model, then all this is a controller right here. So what is hard to test this, I cannot test this code in here without actually hitting a server to get my data back. And I'm also assuming that it's always successful. If this fails, nothing happens. So how would we refactor this to make it unit test friendly? What we do is we break it out. So this is some refactored code. Like I said, the previous code, I'm, I'm saying it's bad, but this is just a different way of looking at it so you can write unit tests for it. So what you can do is you put your data access layer in its own function. You have a function that says get customers and this actually goes out and hits that endpoint. Then you have one function that only deals with the DOM manipulation or the view. But then you have your controller down here that just calls these helper functions. So what I can do is I can write a unit test for this and like tools such as Jasmine, what you can do is you can create spies or mocks to mock this endpoint out. You don't actually have to have a live server what Jasmine will do is it'll, it'll give you mock data. Um, so I could write a unit test for this, and I could also write a unit test for this. The unit test for your views, to me, they're usually kind of lame. I, I don't generally test my views, but what I can do is call this helper function and inspect the DOM to make sure that it's generating semantic HTML that I can then eventually style any way that I want. So 
does this, does this code read better or easier to read than this code? To me, I'm, I might be by bias, but this is code that I typically would write, but I'm getting to a point where I'm starting to think about testing this code and how I can write it in a test-driven manner. So this is one, they both do the exact same thing. They're two different approaches. So this example right here, it may be a little bit hard to see, but what I have is I have a Jasmine uh, unit test right here. I've described it, expect, and I have a really simple module. This is using Browserify. Um, you can see return not imp implemented. Um, but over here is my task runner. This is Gulp. What it's doing is every single time I save either one of these files, my Gulp task will rerun my unit tests. So uh, what you can see is, uh, let's, where is the mouse? So what you can see is as I run this, as I change this file, my tests are failing. Now I can actually return what I'm expecting, rerun, and see that green dot, it shows that it passed. I can now change my test, see my test fail. I can come back in here and then change my implementation and then watch it pass. Now, what this allows me to do, I don't even need a browser open. I don't need to be refreshing my browser. I don't need to alt tab back and forth. I can very quickly change my implementation of my actual module or even my, my code and just not even go there. I can refactor very quickly to make sure that as I refactor, I do not break anything. So unit testing is where I spent most of my time, but integration, te in integration test is another extremely important piece. As you bring these components together, do they actually work together? So uh, I gave the example of the model view and controller. So you generally have each one of those pieces as its own component. And then as you bring your model view controller together, how does it work as an application of a whole? The interaction between the server, your AJAX requests, you can actually go out and hit your live server. So let's say you're using RESTful URLs. You can go out there and start exercising those HTTP requests to make sure that your server is returning the right information. Or if your server changed, maybe the endpoint changed or the data that's coming back changed, you can have tests that automate that entire process. Uh, I like to call it uh, bread operations instead of CRUD because I've been burned on CRUD. When you say read and CRUD, what are you getting back? Are you getting an array or are you getting an object? So I like to say bread because the B explicitly says I'm browsing for information. I'm querying. I'm getting an array of data back. If I say read, I'm getting an explicit object back. I can't tell you how many times where I was expecting an array back and I got an object and I say object dot for each. Boom. Runtime error. Little things like that, you can start writing your code and communicating back and forth to exercise some good practices to prevent those little things from happening. Um, so testing API endpoints. So this is an example of some unit tests and integration tests that I was using with Jasmine. This form validator, uh, and that's, okay, I guess that's not gonna turn on for me, but where the, form where the form validator test cases, those are testing all the different ways I'm expecting my inputs to fail. The data access test, this is me actually hitting the web server to make sure that it's responding, that my endpoints are there, that the data is coming back in a manner that I'm expecting. Uh, you can think of in the Java world, there's data transfer objects. Uh, we're using that a lot in our JavaScript so if the server side values change, we only have to change it in one spot in our client side code. That way, let's say a field in the database or in your web service was coming back as full name, and now it's just name. Do you want to go change that in 20 different places in your client side code across many different components? You can use a data transfer object to do that mapping in just one place. That way, your conceptual model is separate from your storage mo model. You can kind of think of entity framework if you're familiar with it. Um, so uh, we've built a open source project called Instagram for Events, where it basically hits Instagram's API, it looks for a hashtag, and it returns photos back, and it displays it in a rotating manner. So we built web services for it, and we're just getting photos. Well, what if we want to start it 
to, or let's say we wanted to start injecting advertisements in there or sponsors in there. Um, it would be very time consuming to go to our admin panel, upload a bunch of photos, test all the different scenarios that could ha happen, actually go make those HTTP requests, get it back and, what, and see what comes back. What you can do is uh, uh, mock all that information out so you are getting your data back in a manner all the different possible ways. So with end-to-end -end testing, this is very similar to unit testing um, or to integration testing. What end-to-end -end testing is is basically simulating how customers or users are interacting with your app or your application. And unfortunately, it's, it's unrealistic to manually test all the different scenarios that users may act within your application. So what you want to do is write end-to-end -end tests to simulate that user. So um, a good end-to-end -end test is basically a good friend of yours. You don't want to deploy code and then fill out a form with 30 form fields and then click Submit just to test that web service call. It's not practical to. So using end-to-end -end testing, uh, what Angular uses is Protractor, and it uses a Jasmine-like uh, semantics. So Protractor, they're using describe, they're using it, but instead of expect, what Protractor is bringing in is this element. What I can say is go get me this button and then click it. So this is not a unit test because you're, you're depending on the DOM to be there, you're depending something outside of your module to be there and working. So this end-to-end -end test, you can just say click. Or let's say I did have that form with about 15 fields what I can do is say send keys. So I could use CSS selectors to select my input fields and then send tests to it. So if you have a URL validator, you could send one URL and then make sure that passes. Send another URL, make sure that passes. Send an invalid U URL, it should fail. So this end-to-end -end testing is very easy to get up and run running. If you already have Jasmine unit tests or some kind of unit test framework, a lot of them follow this pattern and it's very easy to start doing this. This um, protractor, it depends on uh, Node Package Manager and WebDriver, but there's a little bit of environment setup. But the little bit of time you spend getting this running, you can then automate over and over and over again. So testing coverage and metrics. So you can write unit tests as a developer, you can have integration tests for your team, but how do you measure success? How do you know these unit tests are valuable? How do you know that it's actually working for your team or for your app? What you can do is use testing coverage and tools to identify areas that you need to test and also monitor your production environment so when something breaks, you can address it before someone even repeats or before someone ever even reports the problem. So, this is something also extremely easy to do. You can put, this is a very simple example, but all you have to do is say, whenever there's a JavaScript runtime error, make a uh, XML HTTP request and post it somewhere. Go create a web service, maybe, maybe even push it to Google Analytics. Like this is like easy code. Like if you go to Opera's developer network, Opera, the web browser is saying, you should put this in your code base. So if somebody breaks your JavaScript code, um, maybe they did something you didn't even think your users were doing, you're going to find out about it. You can get the message of the error, the error and the URL. You can, yes, go ahead. Will your risk actually accept that? Will your risk accept posting out? When your risk? Risk. Oh, so this, so that's a very good question. The question was, would your company accept this risk posting this out somewhere? So what this could do is you, you could post it to an internal server. You could post it to one of, your one of your environments that you own. So you don't have to push it out somewhere. You can still keep it internal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, writing to a log is a good example. So Google Analytics, if you are actually doing like a GA push, like actually pushing this to Google Analytics, uh, my company wouldn't like that. <laughs> so we post it somewhere else that's internal that we have control of. This is just a very simple way. So if someone is breaking your app or, some, or your app is breaking and you don't know about, about it, you can find out very quickly. You can put an alert on, hey, when this thing is added, get sending an, e an email. So that way you can start inspecting it right away. 
there's tons of different ways to expand on this. One of those ways is uh, Telerik controls. Tel uh, Tel Telerik provides analytics for your app. They take this to an entire different level. They, they, this, this right here is just ex exceptions. We're just talking about exceptions. But what you can find out is, hey, is my app crashing at runtime? Or how often is my app breaking? Who is it breaking for? What, what browser are, are, are they on? Are they international or are they within the United States? What operating system were they on? All these questions can be answered using tools like this. Telerik is just one of them. There's, um, th there's countless things to monitor your production code base. You, you may not find all of the problems, all of the bugs that make it to your production code base, but as soon as something goes wrong, you should know about it. Another uh, tool is uh, Istanbul. So, I mean, I wish my code base had this much code coverage, but what Istanbul says is based on these functions, do you, what amount of unit tests do you have? So it might be a little bit hard to read, but these are function names, and this shows code coverage. 100% code coverage isn't always a good thing. Um, you might have heard the term code smells. Just because you have 100% code coverage doesn't mean the quality of your tests are there and actually fully exercising it. You may have the coverage there, but maybe it's, it's, very, it's lame or it's an unreasonable test case. Just because you have 100% code coverage does not mean you're bug free. A tool like this, um, you can get it, download it, it'll run, it'll run your code, it'll look at your unit tests, your integration tests versus your actual code base and give you coverage. What this tells you is something like this. Hey, I have a function with no unit tests. And this is a large function that's very complex. So if this is your most important function right here, you probably want to have a unit test for it. You probably want to get that in green. So you can see the imbalance here. These small, less complex uh, areas of code have a good amount of test coverage. Over here, though, you need tests for. So, you might want to say, hey, this is complex. We know that this area is fragile. Start writing tests. Start exercising that code for it. Uh, this is a, um, another, another tool called Sonar that you can uh, download and just start running against your code base. Uh, initially, if you don't have any tests, it'll all, it'll all be read. But maybe each iteration, you set a goal for your development team to say, hey, we're going to get at least 10% more code coverage or as we, maybe we have none right now, but as we add new functionality, we're gonna start writing some form of unit tests. Maybe three iterations later, we'll strive for integration tests. Maybe three months from now, we'll start doing end-to-end -end testing. But using these tools and these metrics will help identify where your development team can start improving. So, when to test, it's, it's kind of naive to say always, because it's not always practical, but you should always have at least some form of tests. Even if, if, if you have a three month long quick project that you need to get out the door, you have three months to write one unit test. Write at least one unit test. Figure out how do you actually do this. As soon as you do one, getting two is easy. As soon as you have two, getting to 10 or 100, you'll start seeing the quality of your code is increasing. It will start changing the way you structure your code base. It will start increasing the value and the quality of your code. So always test, but maybe not test everything. Um, the, the hard to reach er areas to code is a, a great place to start too. I've, I've found myself manually re, like reloading the page, filling out a form just to click the submit button to see if data ends up on our server. Well, no, like, come on. Like, you can put mock data in there in an automated test that then just posts to your server, and that way you know your server's working or your endpoints are working as well, too. Uh, the go-to fail bug is a perfect example of how even, ha I'm not saying they did not have unit tests or they were not testing, but if they properly wrote unit tests, that basically stated how the secure, uh, the SSL handshake should take place. If they were testing every step of that algorithm in the way it should work, and maybe in the ways that it should fail, the go-to fail bug never should have happened. The go-to fail bug was in Apple's production code base. It was on my laptop, it was on my phone, it was probably on many on your devices too. All these secure connections, they never were doing the final, hand, final handshake. It was there for 18 months before someone figured it out. 
that bug should have stood out to anyone who was developing it. There, there, there were ways it could be avoided, and as software craftsmen, what we can do is, if we have an algorithm, write tests for it, so as we change the algorithm, uh, we know that we haven't broke anything. Uh, I, I'm making an assumption here, but my assumption is that the go-to fail bug happened because of a copy and paste error. They likely copy and pasted a block of code from somewhere else in their code and pasted it in that switch block or that if statement right there, and they had duplicate code and it just blended in. There's, there's, there's no way to avoid that. I, I refactor code all the time, and I have tools like JS, Lint or J, JS Hint that says undeclared variable or variable used before was defined, or even a compiler flag in the go-to fail case to say, hey, you have an unreachable block of code. That code was just going somewhere else, and you had an unreachable block of code. It was totally preventable. I think we've all written code before where you find out there's a bug after you deploy your code, and you're like, that was, I don't even know how I missed that. It's totally avoidable, and unit tests and testing in general will help you, to help you fix those areas. Um, why test? So, um, I, I really don't like this comic, but it's overused, but it explains why you should test very well. So, there's how the customer explained it, and it's a swing that doesn't make sense, and how the programmer wrote it. It's just, it doesn't really make sense. These are just two pieces that are very complex in a very complicated applica application lifecycle. So your code will change as requirements change. Like your code base will evolve. And even though that those are just two complex pieces, there's so many external factors that you cannot control as a developer that you're gonna have to deal with and probably get blamed for. Um, some people, don't understand that browsers are starting to self-update themselves in the background, and previously deprecated JavaScript functions are gradually being removed. Well, if your app was working, you could come to work the next morning, and it's, your, your app's broken. Maybe they click a button and a modal's supposed to come up, and it, it just doesn't show up. Your app's broken. Maybe there's a runtime error, 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 error for it. As browsers are self-updating, you can't control that. You can turn it off, but how do you know your code is gonna work? Uh, your code is like a car. You can't just drive it and expect it to always work. You have to do maintenance on it. Um, you can add analytics to your code base, so as something breaks, maybe someone self-updated their browser, and your code's breaking, you're gonna know about it as soon as your user found out about it. Um, so, lessons learned. So the past couple months, uh, I've really been trying to strive to add more and more tests to my current code base, as well as any new code that I'm writing. Uh, some big lessons learned I had is consumer versus producer. So as you're building these reusable JavaScript components, you may not always be the producer and the consumer of your component. So I started writing components that only I was using. Now, maybe some other developer is like, oh, we have a requirement for this. I'm like, oh, I have a component for that. Here, just reuse this. And then they start passing in undefines and nulls when in, like, I was expecting a string. So all of a sudden, your, your component's broken. So what you can do is build your components with, with the intention of not just you are the consumer and the producer for it. Um, so a good example of this was uh, Moment.js. Um, don't test some other library. You can, it, it's naive, but you can consider that the framework or tool that you brought in just already works and does what it's supposed to. I was relying on Moment.js to parse a date as a string and display it in a different way. I was writing tests for that, that date to be parsed correctly and that string to be displayed correctly. I was essentially testing Moment.js and they already had tests for that. So I just wasted my time. I didn't need to test that. You don't need to test jQuery and make sure that its Ajax calls are actually going out. You can assume that. Um, it's a little naive, but um, don't waste your cycles. Test your code, not the framework. Um, monitor your production code for exceptions. So um, it's okay to run your code, your tests on productions. Um, it's, it's a little bit weird, but um, in the case of Moment.js, all your code is being executed client-side. It's not putting a load on your server. It does not hurt to test your code on production. There's exceptions to it, 
But in general, with JavaScript, you can run your test on production and have no Im impact. That way, when, I don't know, you update from IE8 to 11, you can just open up IE11 and run your unit test and see if everything still works. Why not? Um, so you might be asking, like, test my code in production. Like, that's, that's crazy. Um, but it honestly does not hurt to test your code in production. Even though you may not be running your unit test in production, someone's testing your code on production. Your users are testing your code on production. As your users use your app, they're testing your code for you in all kinds of different ways. Um, there's a, a meme of someone trying to drink out of a straw, and like, they can't do it. Your users may not use your app the way you intended. So as your users test your code, it doesn't hurt to deploy JavaScript to some page that has a feature toggle that you turn this feature on, this page exists now, run your tests, okay, everything's good, turn that feature off, boom, it's retracted. Um, figuring that out, taking those cycles, spending that time to figure out how to do that is interesting, and to me, it's fun. Um, but don't be this guy. Don't, don't never test your code. It's very easy to write some form of test and start doing it today. Um, as we develop code, figure out how to do it. That was my hardest part, figuring out how do I write tests, figuring out how I deploy tests, figuring out how to respond to change was my hardest part in changing the way that I structured my JavaScript code. So it's ridiculously easy to get started, and you have huge payouts from it. So thank you. So uh, these slides are on SlideShare. Um, there's also um, a Star Trek GitHub. Uh, my slide deck is committed there, so if you go to the, their GitHub, you can pull this down. Um, and if you're interested in scheduling a one-on-one -on -one with me, we can look at your code and maybe see how we could restructure it, how we could start unit testing and integration and then test testing your code today. Thank you. Thanks.